if presenters are in the room, could you come to the front?
All right, good morning, everyone. We're gonna start the session. And Judy Hoffman from UC Berkeley, who is gonna move to Georgia Tech soon, and myself, Alex from UIUC, uh, are actually looking forward to chairing a very exciting session. We're gonna have one honorable mention in that session, as well as, um, as you may know, the, the best paper award. So it's gonna be a very exciting session. Make sure that you wake up quickly or grab some more coffee. All right, we're going to start the session right away with the honorable mention, which is uh, going to be efficient optimization for rank-based uh, loss function um, by Prashit Mahapatra, Mikhail Rolinek, C.V. Yavahar, Vladimir Karmagorov, and Pawan Kumar. And Pritish is going to give the presentation. Hello everyone, uh, I'll be uh, presenting a work on efficient optimization for rank-based loss functions. Uh, to explain this work, let's start with the problem of ranking, in which uh, given a set of images and a query, in this case the action jumping, uh, you'd want to rank the images according to their relevance to the uh, query. The standard pipeline to do this is to first collect a data set, uh, then use the data to learn a ranking model, uh, the ranking model then would assign a score to each of the samples, uh, which you then use to sort the sam uh, samples to get a ranking. Uh, generally, one would use a ranking measure like AP or NDCZ to uh, evaluate the ranking model. Um, however, when it comes to learning the model parameter, uh, it's popular to use simple loss functions like the 0-1 loss because they are differentiable and easy to optimize. Uh, but ideally, one would want to directly optimize rank-based loss functions. So uh, there have been some work in this direction uh, which optimize rank-based loss functions for learning, learning model parameters, and they do give better performance compared to uh, zero-one loss. Uh, however, this uh, most often comes with uh, heavy additional computational time, uh, which might sometimes uh, discourage uses of rank-based loss functions. So this heavy uh, additional computational time is generally because of the expensive gradient computation procedure involved in it. Uh, which goes as follows. Uh, first, you assign a score to each of the samples, uh, and then the sample scores can determine a score for each of the candidate rankings. Uh, each candidate ranking would also have a ranking loss value attached to it. And uh, for most popular optimization frameworks uh, for optimizing um, uh, rank-based loss functions, for example, when optimizing max margin upper bound to a loss or uh, the positive version of the direct loss minimization framework. Uh, in order to compute the gradient, uh, you have to solve an optimization problem which involves maximizing a uh, summation of the ranking score and the ranking loss uh, over all possible candidate rankings. So the most validating ranking which is, uh, is, uh, is the optimal solution to this optimization problem. And uh, computing the most validating ranking efficiently would allow you to compute the gradients efficiently. Um, most often, this wouldn't be this would be expensive for generic rank-based loss functions. However, uh, we show that it can be done efficiently for a class of rank-based loss functions. Um, we claim that uh, a loss function which would have this structure should be amenable to efficient optimization. Uh, here, the term R of xi refers to the interleaving rank of the ith most relevant negative sample. Uh, the interleaving rank is defined as, uh, the, for a negative sample, is defined as the number of positive samples preceding it. So, uh, for example, in this ranking, uh, the first two negative samples would have an interleaving rank of one because they are preceded by a single positive sample. And the interleaving rank for the next two pos negative samples would be two because they are preceded by two positive samples. So, uh, we call any rank based loss function that has this structure as QS suitable and popular rank-based loss functions like AP loss and NDCZ loss actually fall in this category. So uh, this structure leads to efficient optimization mostly because of two key properties, the first being the negative decomposability property, and the second being the interleaving dependence property. Uh, first, uh, discussing the negative decomposability property, uh, the fact that the loss function is additively decomposable onto negative sample uh, leads to the most validating ranking to have a structure which allows 
computation of the optimal interleaving rank of each negative sample independently. Further, uh, the fact that each of the terms in the summation are dependent only on the interleaving rank of the negative sample uh, leads to the following property that given a ranking, if you change the ranking in a way that changes the interleaving pattern, then the loss function would also change. However, if you change the ranking in a way that doesn't change the interleaving pattern, the loss wouldn't change. So essentially, the loss function depends only on the interleaving pattern of the negative and the positive sample among themselves. So what this means is that uh, now there can be multiple possible most violating rankings. So we actually leverage this redundancy in, uh, in designing our efficient optimization algorithm. So now the most valid ranking would have a partial ordering structure, uh, which looks like this, that if a negative sample has a score that is greater than the score of another negative sample, then the interleaving rank of the first sample should be less than the interleaving rank of the second one. For example, in this ranking, since the first two negative samples have an interleaving rank that is less than the next two negative samples, the scores of the first two should be greater than the scores of the next two. So, and similarly, this would also hold true for uh, the positive samples. So now that we have looked at properties uh, that uh, are necessary for efficient optimization, let's look at uh, the algorithm that we propose that um, helps in optimizing rank-based loss functions efficiently. So given a set of images and their corresponding scores, the height of the vertical bars here are proportional to the scores. Uh, we can compute the gradient in two steps. Uh, first of all, uh, we need to induce the partial ordering structure uh, in the positive and the negative samples separately. And then we need to find the optimal interleaving pattern among the positive and the negative samples. Uh, previously, uh, the partial ordering structure has been induced for positive samples by completely sorting them with a computational cost of the order of p log p. Similarly, for the negative samples, we sort them completely with the computational cost of the order of n log n. And after this is done, we compute the optim optimal interleaving pattern by uh, finding the optimal interleaving rank for each of the negative samples independently. And this comes at a cost of um, the order of n, uh, NP. So um, here for most real world data sets though, the number of negative samples should be greater than the positives. So the overall complexity now um, becomes of the order of n log n plus p n for this algorithm. Uh, however, in this, uh, the uh, thing to note is that the parcel ordering structure doesn't demand the complete sorting of the positive or the negative samples. So we are essentially doing uh, a lot of wasteful computation here, uh, which we try to tackle by still sorting the positive samples completely because it's not the computational bottleneck. But for the negative samples, we instead go for a quick sort flavored algorithm which, in which in each iteration we choose a negative sample as a pivot find its appropriate place in the ordering of the negative samples, and then assign it its optimal interleaving rank. And we repeat this recursively in each iteration, choosing a pivot, finding its appropriate place in the ordering of the negative samples, and then assigning the corresponding interleaving rank. Now, at this stage, uh, a key thing to note is, if there are negative samples, which have scores that lie between the scores of negative samples that have already been assigned the same interleaving rank, then the parcel ordering structure dictates that those two negative samples should be assigned the same interleaving rank. So what we did here is that we assigned int optimal interleaving rank to two negative samples for free without any additional computation. So now the quicksort flavored algorithm that we propose has an overall uh, complexity of the order of p log p plus n log p plus p log n. And for real world data sets, this is um, uh, of the order of n log p. And this is much better than uh, what we have for the baseline optimization algorithm, which is, the, which is of the order of n log n plus pn. Moreover, we also show that uh, this is actually the best that you can do for using any comparison-based algorithms. Now, this is the worst case complexity of our method, uh, looking at its empirical performance. Uh, first of all, we uh, apply our method for learning action classification models on the Pascal dataset. And we observe that when we use uh, for rank-based loss functions like AP and NDCG loss. Uh, using them to learn model parameter actually leads to better performance, significantly better performance than 0-1 loss. 
Uh, while this would have come at an additional computational cost uh, when using the baseline uh, optimization algorithms, using our quicksort flavor algorithm leads to a computational time that is more or less comparable to that of the zero one loss. So essentially we got improvement in performance but without any additional computational cost here. So our algorithm here represented by the green curve uh, scales really well when uh, the total number of samples are increased compared to the baseline optimization algorithm represented by the red curve here. And similarly we also obtain good scaling when uh, only the positive or the negative samples are increased in the data set. Further we uh, use our method to uh, train weakly supervised object detection models we are on the Pascal VOC data set. Again, we see that optimizing rank-based loss functions like AP loss uh, leads to consistent improvement across classes uh, with a mean improvement of greater than 7%. And again, while the baseline optimization algorithm would have led to uh, heavy additional computational time using our quicksort level algorithm leads to a computational time that is more or less comparable to that of the zero one loss. Finally, we use our um, method to train a deep model on, a C on the CIFA 10 data set. Again, we observe um, improvement in performance for when using AP or NDCZ loss to train the model. And using our quicksort flavor algorithm leads to a training time that is uh, significantly lower compared to the baseline optimization algorithm. In this case though, the bottleneck is not the gradient computation procedure, rather it's the back propagation and the feature computation uh, steps here. The final takeaway from this presentation should be that it's definitely good to optimize a rank-based loss function to learn a ranking model because it's lead to, leads to better uh, performance. However, uh, it's expensive most often to r optimize a rank-based loss function. Um, on the other hand though, if, you, if the rank-based loss function that you're using has a partial, uh, Q QS suitable structure, uh, then you can expect the optimization to be efficient. So overall, you get an improvement in performance, but without any additional uh, computational time in it. Thank you. We have time for one or two questions. If you have questions, please come up to the microphones. While you're coming up to the microphones, let me start with one question. Um, other score functions uh, such as F-score or mean reciprocal rank um, are often used in ranking-based losses as well. Right. Um, I wonder whether those are um, applicable to the optimization scheme that you described and what were the main challenges if you would want to optimize those? Uh, we actually haven't uh, tried those loss functions, uh, those scores yet. So like we have to see that. I have, I'm not sure like if. Okay. Do we have other questions? Maybe so, I can ask. So, uh, so just to add to the, what I said over the mm -hmm. previous question, so uh, we uh, so if it has the structure that uh, that we see here, this um, negative decomposability with that interleaving dependence property. But in addition to this, there are two other uh, properties that we need to hold. That uh, there is a certain monotonicity property that uh, the loss function should also have. If they do satisfy all those properties, then it's guaranteed that you can have an optimization algorithm that goes with this complexity. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, I guess my second question was related to this negative decomposability. Okay. I wonder if you were to change it to positive decomposability. Right. Um, would you be able to derive a similar algorithm, um, and what would change? Um, it's um, so. I um, I think it shouldn't change. Um, it, uh, it might depend on the loss function. Yeah, if it uh, treats the positive and the negative samples uh, differently, and it's not symmetric in that sense, it, 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 might, it might change actually. So because this, uh, if we do um, the structure that we have and the uh, theorems that we have that guarantees this do depend on like how you treat the negative samples and the positive samples. If, it, if, uh, if there is a, some sort of symmetry in that, then it shouldn't matter, otherwise it would matter. I guess, yeah. Okay, cool. All right, oh, we have one question, great. Uh, hi, thank you for the good talk. Um, so uh, you were trying to hint at, this is a continuation of the line of questions that you've received, you were trying to hint at this in your, in your book that there are, the assumption implies that there are some rankings that you cannot differentiate between where the negative uh, samples are permuted amongst themselves because it's a partial ordering. 
which suggests that there may be cases where if your if your problem is not a zero one ranking annotation problem, if there is a user in the loop that tells you I prefer this right. example over this other example, would that so that that would not fall under this class of uh, yes. In this case, we assume that the in, uh, the ground truth that you have is only a zero one labeling of the data, but you want a pre uh, rank retrieval prediction uh, from your model. And so, have you thought about ways of extending this that your decomposability is not over unary negative scores but pairwise? Oh, uh, not really. Like as of now, in this framework, not. Thank you. All right, let's thank, appreciate again. And next up, we have a paper about Wasserstein introspective neural networks um, by Kwon Yun Lee, Wei Jian Zhu, Fan Fan, and Xu Wen Tu. from UC San Diego. Today I'll present our model Wasserstein Introspective Neural Networks. This is a work with my co-authors Wei Jian Xu, Fan Fan, and my advisor Joan Tu at UC San Diego. There is a rich history behind generative models. Here we would like to mention three lines of prior work that are worth highlighting. Before deep learning era, Generative model ha had been mostly guided by maximum likelihood theories. There are also attempts of building generative models from discrete classifiers. Welling et al. 2003 built a boosting algorithm combining weak classifiers to perform density estimation, whereas two 2007 built a cascade of classifiers for generative image modeling. Goodfellow et al proposed generative adversarial networks, which learn a generative model with the help of a discrete model. GAN and follow-up work have attracted a tremendous amount of attraction recently in machine learning and computer vision by producing high-quality synthesized images. Before we introduce our algorithm, we review prior algorithms which inspired our work. In two, 2007 work, the goal is to learn the distribution of positives. In an unsupervised setting, given, given a set of examples, we first draw random samples from a reference distribution. We then train a discriminant classifier to separate the given training data, data from the random samples. Here, the boosting classifier was used, then the pseudo-negatives or fake samples that satisfy the boosting classifiers are drawn in the next step. The boosting classifier was trained to separate them in the second step. The algorithm continues until the given data and the pseudo-negatives are not separable. An explicit energy-based model is obtained from a cascade of boosting classifiers. 2007 show their algorithm can be applied to a variety of applications including texture modeling, face modeling, and learning image statistics and denoising. More recently, introspective neural networks were proposed to enhance the representation power and speed up the synthesis process using the gradient descent algorithm. So there's a paper by Lazar et al. in ICCB 2017 there's also NIF's, set, NIF's paper by Jin et al., which focused on the classification improvement. <clears throat> Although INNG points to a promising direction to obtain a single model being simultaneously a good dis generator and a discriminator, a sequence of CNNs typically 10 to 60 were required to generate realistic images. Hence, once problem we are trying to address here is to 
reduce the number of classifiers to a reasonable number. The power within classification setting was revealed in ICN, which aims at improving classification accuracy and robustness within a single CNN, but its generative capability was limited. Hence, if the generative modeling power of, the, of a single CNN is enhanced, we can enjoy the benefit of endowing image classification CN, CNN with generative capabilities. This is our second motivation. Recently, Arjovsky et al. popularized Wasserstein distance, claiming that it provides more stable gradient. Thus, we propose to adopt Wasserstein distance to INS to better utilize the representation power of CNNs. A new algorithm, Wasserstein Introspective Neural Networks, or WIN, that enhance INS generative modeling capabilities and inherit the desirable properties of both INNG and ICN is proposed. Now let's discuss the high level idea of WIN. Here we retain only a single CNN. As before, classifier iteratively learns to distinguish between training examples and pseudo-negative or fake examples. Initially, a classifier is trained to discriminate samples from a training distribution and the pseudo-negative distribution. Then, we sample images that are within the decision boundary of positives in the classifier. Those images are then added to the set of pseudo-negatives for the next step. Note that unlike other generative models, we keep all the history of pseudo-negatives for the reason that will be clear in the next slide. Next, we train to discriminate between true samples and positive pseudo-negatives, then the decision boundary returned by the second classifiers gets even closer to the positives. By repeating these steps, the decision boundary defined by the sequence of classifiers approaches the target distribution. Next, let's take a closer look at the classification step. We minimize the Wasserstein loss with gradient penalty to enforce the classifier output F sub WT to be one Lipschitz. We can interpret the F sub T as a negative energy. It is a negative energy in the sense that the loss enforces F sub T to be high in the manifold of positives and low in the space of negatives. In this sense, we note that minimizing Wasserstein loss amounts to maximizing energy difference between real and pseudo-negative examples. Since the negatives span a much larger space than the positives, it is very crucial to have pseudo-negatives cover the entire space. This is the reason why we are keeping all the history of pseudo-negatives. Next, let's take a look at synthesis step. In this step, the objective is to produce pseudo-negative samples with a negative energy similar to the negative energy of positive samples. In classifier's perspective, the negative energy can be understood as a goodness or quality of the images. In this sense, we're generating the pseudo-negatives that are indistinguishable from the positive samples. When we sample a pseudo-negative, we start from an image initialized with ran random noise, then we do gradient ascent until it matches the energy of positive samples. It has been noted in the feature visualization literatures that achieving diversity in the optimization-based image synthesis is very challenging. A few solutions which alleviate the diversity issue have been proposed However, we found that such techniques are not effective in our model. Thus, we, we find that a very simple image initialization scheme <laughs> greatly encourages the diversity of the sampled images. When initializing the image, <laughs> rather than sampling from IID Gaussian, we sample from a CNN with random weights. For details, please refer to our paper. 
Using our new noise distribution, we improved the inception score in CIFAR 10 from 2.57 to 4.62 within a single CNN. We compared the texture modeling on a descriptive method, optimization based method, methods based, based on feed for networks, and introspective networks. When single shows a significant improvement over ING single and comparable results to ING, which uses 20 CNNs. Each of the texture image has a size of 256 by 256. During training, we train our network to model 64 by 64 patches chosen at random locations. After training is done on the patch-based model, we try to synthesize texture images of larger size. During the synthesis process, we keep a single working image of size 320 by 320. In each iteration, we sample a fixed number of patches from the working image and perform gradient ascent on the chosen patches. For the overlapping pixels between patches, we take the average of the gradient assigned to such pixels. We need an energy-based model that is able to inherently model the input image space. As a result, as we can see from the animation, stitching together image patches while maintaining the coherence of the coherence of the entire image is natural. Whereas in other models that works in feed forward fashion, it's not straightforward to enforce the local consistencies of the patterns. Next, let's, let's see the results for unsupervised image modeling. First, we show the results of face modeling on DC GAN INNG single, INN cascades, wind single, and wind cascades. Although WIN was developed as a generative model with a single CNN, in order to boost the results, we also experiment with cascaded versions similar to INNG. We can see that WIN single attains image quality even higher than that of INNG, which uses 12 CNNs. We also show the results of CIFAR-10 modeling on GAN and WIN. In terms of inception score, WIN is when with five CNN produces a result close to WGAN, but there's still a gap to the state-of-the-art result by WGAN with gradient penalty. As a note, we find that our algorithm is agnostic to the type of classifiers. Our algorithm can still produce good-looking images with ResNet and DenseNet. This illustrates that by the adopting WIN algorithm, state-of-the-art CNN class classifiers can be easily turned into generative models. To test the ability of WIN model as an image classifier, we present ex experiments on the supervised classification test tasks. In this part, we jointly minimize standard cross-entropy loss for multiple class classification with a Wasserstein loss. On the left, we see the classification errors of baseline and WIN. On the right, we show the synthesized images from the corresponding ResNet classifiers. We see that when applied to ResNet 32, WIN is not losing ResNet's superior classification ability in standard supervised classification while attaining special generative capability that do not exist in ResNet. Also, uh, WIN demonstrates robustness to adversarial examples. Uh, we note that unlike existing methods in adversarial defenses, our method does not uh, train networks with specific types of adversarial examples. Having seen the algorithms of WGAN and WIN, a natural question arises, why don't we just train WGAN and do gradient ascent to sample images? To answer this question, we make some comparisons. As an analogy, we can think of generator as an artist and a discriminator as an art critic. After the, after the training is done, if we ask the discriminator of WGAN to produce the image he's happy with, these are the images we get. In contrast, the network in WIN is simultaneously critic and an artist. For this reason, we, when we ask the critic of WIN to generate the faces that he's happy with, we get good, real looking faces. Finally, we summarize the properties of WIN First, our model is a single CNN classifier that is, that is simultaneously discriminative and generative. Secondly, our training algorithm results in an energy-based generative model. 
third, we demonstrate that our model retrain, retains classification results on par with the state of the art of producing competitive image synthesis with a few CNNs. Lastly, we also show that resulting model has improved robustness against adversarial examples in classification. Okay. Thank you for your attention. All right, we have time for one short question. Let me ask one question real quick. I guess um, GANs have this appealing property that just a single forward pass is, is fine to produce samples, whereas in your case, you need to do this back propagation yes, yeah. step. How expensive is that step? Uh, I think it, it takes a few seconds to sample images. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's thank the speakers again. All right, so I'm sure many of you are very interested to hear the next talk, as it's the best paper award. Unfortunately, there's some technical difficulties right now, so we're going to move ahead with the program and hopefully do that talk at the end after the spotlight session. So now we're going... Here. Now we're going to have a talk on maximum classifier discrepancy for unsupervised domain adaptation. This talk is by Kuniaki Seto, Kohei Watanabe, Yoshitaka Ushiku, and Tatsuya Harada. And the talk will be given by two, Kukun, uh, Kuniaki. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm Kunyaki Saito, and I'm from the University of Tokyo. I'd like to introduce our work, Maximum Classifier Discrepancy for Unsupervised Domain Adaptation. This work is uh, done with Kohei Watanabe, Yoshitaka Ushiku, and Tatsuya Harada. Okay, let's look into uh, with the background of our research. Supervised learning method using a large model, such as convolutional neural networks, have achieved a significant progress in the recognition accuracy in many fields. However, uh, we have to collect a lot of annotated samples to train such a large model. To solve the problem, uh, we often aim to transfer knowledge obtained in level-rich domain to level-scarce domain. So consider a problem of semantic segmentation. The synthesized images are easily annotated, and a large number of them are available. So we consider utilizing a model trained on the synthesized images to recognize unraveled real images. But in reality, such a model transfer doesn't go well. Synthesized images and real images have different characteristics. So in many cases, we have to deal with the difference of domains in order to effectively transfer the knowledge between different domains. A proposed method to bridge the gap between the domains is effective for this kind of situation. I'd like to look into our method, providing some backgrounds and related work in the following slides. Uh, domain adaptation, uh, the research of domain adaptation tackles the difficulty of transferring knowledge, knowledge between different domains. So we aim to train a good classifier that works well on the target domain. The target domain is a level scarce domain, and the source domain is a level rich domain. So basically the task in source and target domain is the same one. Especially in this work, we tackled the, uh, the task of unsupervised domain adaptation, where leveled source samples and unleveled target samples are provided during training. If we can train a good classifier for the target domain in this situation, we can effect efficiently reduce the annotation cost uh, for the target samples. I have shown the example of semantic segmentation in the previous slide, but the semantic segmentation can be seen as a special case of image classification. So I will explain a method uh, with uh, this standard uh, image, classification set, image classification setting as shown in the bottom of the slide. Okay, I'd like to uh, explain the popular approach for unsupervised domain adaptation. Uh, distribution matching method using a domain classifier is a popular, popular approach for unsupervised domain adaptation. The method assumes that the samples of the same class in different domains should have, uh, should have similar features, but they have, uh, also they have different features because 
the domains are different. So they assume that they can train feature extractor to reduce the domain difference in order to improve the classification accuracy. So in order to know the difference of domains, they train the domain classifier. Domain classifier is trained to discriminate the uh, domain of features to measure the difference of domains. Whereas the feature generator are trained to uh, deceive the domain classifier. Feature generator runs to match feature distributions. Uh, and the task specific classifiers are trained by source samples. The target feature, target samples will be classified correctly in the aligned distributions. The method is uh, known to be work well for various tasks such as image classification and <coughs> semantic segmentation. But we think that there is one problem in this method. The method doesn't consider the relationship between task specific classifier and uh, the target features. So to deceive the domain classifier, the feature generator can generate ambiguous target features, which are generated near the decision boundary. But such, the, such uh, features are not discriminative one. So in our work, we propose a method to extract more discriminative features for unsupervised domain adaptation. So uh, we propose a distribution alignment method using task-specific classifiers. We aim to account for the relationship between the task-specific classifier decision boundary and target features. And we aim to extract discriminative features useful for classification. Our method is a new adversarial learning method for unsupervised domain adaptation. And please note that uh, our method consists of one feature generator networks and two task-specific classifier networks. These modules are shared across domains and uh, using these networks, uh, we aim to obtain discriminative features uh, for the target domain. I'd like to introduce how we achieved adaptation in the following slides. Uh, first, uh, what we have to do in, the, in a supervised domain adaptation is detecting target features uh, far from source features because such features are likely to be misclassified. Then, we propose to measure the region marked with uh, black lines in the left figure. The region indicates the target features are far from source ones. If we can delete such region completely, the target features should be aligned with source and they will be classified correctly, as shown in the right figure. Such features are discriminative one and we aim to obtain such uh, feature distribution. I'd like to introduce the key idea in our, our work. Uh, the discrepancy is a key idea in our method. We propose to measure the region by using two classifier disagreement on their predictions. We define discrepancy as the disag disagreement of two task-specific classifiers' predictions. We train two distinct classifiers that can uh, classify source samples correctly, but they, uh, we also train the classifiers to have different characteristics for the target features. As we can see in this figure, less dis discriminative target features are likely to have region with large discrepancy. On the other hand, well-aligned uh, target features do not have such a region. Since two classifiers are made to classify source samples correctly, they should agree on the prediction for source. Therefore, target features with small discrepancy should be discriminative. To sum up, uh, we can see how discriminative hard the target features are by seeing the discrepancy of two classifiers. Okay, let's look into the training procedure of our method. Uh, uh, before explaining uh, the detail of the training procedure, please note that uh, we have one feature generator and two classification networks. And the classification networks take input from the feature generator. Okay, first, uh, we train the two classifiers to maximize the discrepancy for fixed feature generator. Uh, this operation is to effectively detect the target samples, target features far from source ones. If the two classifiers are made a completely same one or a very similar one, the such two classifiers will not be able to detect the target samples correctly. Then, we trained a feature generator to minimize the discrepancy for the fixed two classifiers. This operation is to obtain discriminative target features. Uh, as you can see in this slide, uh, we aim to move the feature distributions of the target uh, near the source ones. 
And we repeatedly train the two kinds of players in an adversarial way, and we aim to obtain discriminative features. The target features are aligned with the source, uh, considering the relationship between the task-specific classifier and target features. Okay, I have explained the overview of our method, so I will look into more details. Uh, for the loss function, we calculated cross-entropy loss for source samples because they have levels. The discrepancy loss indicated uh, by large D is calculated for target samples. And we calculated it by using the two uh, probabilistic outputs from the two classifiers. And in this work, we use L1 distance for the loss. But this loss function uh, it can be uh, re replaced by other divergence function, such as callback library divergence. And we initialize all networks uh, with random weight to make the two classifiers different one. And we trained the models by three steps, three steps procedure, uh, power one mini batch uh, to incorporate the loss for source and discrepancy for target. But the key component of our method is an adversarial learning step, maximizing a discrepancy for the two classifiers and minimizing it uh, for the feature generator. Our method also has a connection with the theory of domain adaptation. The theory uh, proposed by Ben David indicates uh, domain divergence is measured by a disagreement of two classifiers. With some assumptions and deformation, we can obtain the adversarial learning step we propose in our work. Uh, please see our paper for more detail. Okay, let's look into some experimental results. Uh, first, uh, we conducted image classification uh, experiments using a uh, digits data set. Our method performed better than other methods, including uh, distribution matching, me matching based methods. So we can see clear effectiveness of accounting for the relationship between task specific boundary and target features. Uh, these are learning curves for our method. Red and green line indicates the accuracy, whereas blue line indicates the discrepancy loss. So we can see that as the discrepancy loss decreases, the features become discriminative and accuracy improves. So the learning proceeds as we expected. Also, our method is uh, easily applied to semantic segmentation. Semantic segmentation is a kind of pixel-wise classification problem. So we calculated a discrepancy in a pixel-wise way. Uh, this is the only difference from the method used in classification. Uh, compared to other methods, uh, our method demonstrates better performance. And uh, improvement in MIOU is very large. Uh, I compared uh, the model, uh, source only model. Source only model is a trained by source samples without uh, any adaptation method. And we can see clear improvement uh, when we use a uh, dilated residual network. These are examples of results obtained by dilated residual network. The existing method outputs a little confusing mark for a person, uh, whereas our method outputs a clear one. So we can also see the effectiveness of uh, considering the relationship between task specific decision boundary and target features. Uh, in this work, uh, we use one feature generator and two classification networks, but we propose a new method which can achieve adaptation using only one classification network. We propose to use, use just one classification network but during training, uh, we propose to uh, sample two classification networks using Dropout. And this method works well in image classification and semantic segmentation. So the work is accepted, accepted by iClear. So please read uh, the paper for more detail. Uh, please uh, come to our poster session. And thank you. Uh, people have questions, can you start lining up at the microphones in the center aisles? And our spotlight presenters, we're still missing some of you. Can you come to the front of the room and uh, line up so that we can do those smoothly? Um, and just one more reminder, if you're here waiting for the taxonomy talk, that will happen after the spotlight session. So do we have, I think we have a question. Yes, thank you, very interesting talk. I was just wondering, if you go through your method, the feature generator that is created, is it in some sense a universal feature generator? In other words, if you were then to take a second target, 
would you be able to use it directly or do you have to go through your method a second time for it to work for two targets? Uh, uh, we, have, we didn't investigate uh, the situation where we have two target domains, but I think, uh, uh, I think we can continuously train the, uh, our feature generator and the two classification networks to adapt uh, more than two uh, target uh, domains. But in your opinion, do you think it would work on the second target without training it? I think uh, it depends on the uh, domains. If the two, do two target domains are similar, the networks will, be, uh, will work well without uh, training, uh, without adapting to a new target domain. But I think if the two domains are totally different one, we have to uh, retrain the networks with our method again. Are there any other questions? All right, let's thank our speaker again. Hi, um, I'm Jerome. I would like to present our paper for uh, on supervised feature learning. Uh, so supervised feature learning has made tremendous progress for uh, uh, by learning from big visual data. However, collecting human labels and uh, uh, can, can human annotations can be very expensive and sometimes even unreliable. So recently, uh, unsupervised feature learning has received increasing attention. So previously, a lot of models have been proposed by uh, supervised feature learning, such as uh, clustering, uh, generative modeling, and uh, self-supervised feature learning. Uh, so the overall goal of unsupervised feature learning is to learn a feature representation which can be used for her high-level mm -hmm. uh, visual recognition problems, for example, object recognition and object detection. So the past work of unsupervised feature learning uh, faces several uh, limitations. So first, uh, they train the feature representation with dedicated losses, such as motion, context, or color. However, there's no clear understanding of how these uh, losses, uh, low-level cues, relate to semantics. Second, they use a linear SVM to, to test the performance of features. So if you're allowed to use a parameter classifier, why not use a kernel classifier, even the deep neural nets? And so third, as a result, there's a large discrepancy between training and testing, so which makes it very difficult to analyze uh, current models. So in this work, we propose a non-parametric solution to unsupervised feature learning. So our model also outputs feature embedding from images. However, we define sim uh, sim similarity metrics between images uh, on the feature embeddings, such as cosine similarities. Uh, training and evaluation are consistently uh, performed on a single metric without introducing any model, model parameters after feature extraction. So to train our model, we still need to design a loss function. We draw ideas from supervised feature learning, and we observe that for a CNN trained on uh, ImageNet, the typical softmax output responses form a correlated class di distribution. For example, uh, ground truth image leopard also has a high response on class jaguar, cheetah, and snow leopard. So we're going to take this idea to the extreme by treating each instance as a class with the hope that the algorithm can automatically discover relationship between instances just as the way the supervised uh, algorithm can discover relationship between classes. So uh, our final solution uh, to unsupervised feature learning is uh, non-parametric instance discrimination. The size of the feature embedding is just 128 dimension for each image, which enables us to compress the whole image net into 600 megabytes. So during training, we use a memory bank to store all the embeddings. So our model works with all state-of-the-art uh, CN architectures, such as VDG and ResNet. So during test time, nearest neighbor search can, on the learned metric can also be reasonably fast with 50 uh, images per second. So here we show the training loss and testing accuracy through the learning epochs. So we can see the testing accuracy continues to improve as the model fits to the training data. So this is highly non-trivial because for unsupervised feature learning, training and testing has totally different targets. 
So the table shows uh, our main results on image net classification. Our best model achieved a top one accuracy of uh, 46 with just 128 dimensional features. Uh, previous uh, state of the art can only achieve around 35 with 10,000 dimensional features with a linear SVM. So we show some examples of our visual retrievals on the learned similarity metrics. The first column is the query from the validation set, and uh, the rest is the, the nearest neighbors from the training set. Um, so our poster ID is C22. Uh, welcome to our poster for more details. Hello everyone, I'm Yang from University of Cambridge. Today I will give a brief introduction about our work, Multitask Adversarial Network for Disentangled Feature Learning. This is a joint work with University of Cambridge and Adobe Research. The motivation of this work comes from an observation. There are multiple independent factors exist in the image generation process, but in most applications, only some or part of the factors are of our interest. I show in the following example. In the, the images of human faces are determined by at least two factors, identity and pose. But in face recognition, normally only the identity of the human is the factor of our interest. We will call it primary factor or content factor. All the other factors such as poses, expressions, and illuminations are distraction factors. We will call them style factors in the following slides. This work, we address two research questions. The first one is, if we are only interested in the performance of the primary factor prediction, can we do better than conventional multitask learning that learn a shared representation to predict all the factors? The second question here is, is it really necessary to train on all the combination of all factors to make our model generalize better? The network architecture of our multitask adversarial network is shown in the slides. The main idea here is we want to learn from two adversarial tasks. We want to learn such a feature that is only good for the content recognition, but not for differentiating sales. It contains four components, an encoder, a generator, and two discriminators. An image first fed into the image encoder to achieve its target representation. It could be used as the input for both content and style discriminators, DC and DS here. The encoder and the content discriminator works cooperatively to minimize the classification loss driven by the content label, while the encoder and the style discriminator works in an adversarial game, which could be formalized into a minimax problem. In order to make sure the feature representation is a full com description of the image content of the original input. We could also add another generation branch on the top. We want to generate an image which match the content of the original image, but with a new style indicated or given by the style indicator. Depending on whether the style indicator is the same as the style of the original input, we could either reconstruct the original image or transfer it to a new style given by the style indicator. The mass formulation is shown on the right-hand side of, on this slide. Finally comes the results and conclusion. A disentangled representation can be obtained. The learned representation is significantly more robust to those distraction factors. Our approach could achieve the state of the art performance in the face and font recognition. Another benefit of this design is it enables controllable generation of new data through a generative model. Given a text or a face image, we could transfer it to a new style given by the fixed glyph content or the, the face in different illumination or poses condition. For more, de more details, you can find in our poster as D3. Thanks again for all your attention. Welcome to a spotlight talk titled Learning from Synthetic Data, Addressing Domain Shift for Semantic Segmentation. I'm Swami, and this is joint work with collaborators from the University of Maryland 
and G Global Research. The problem of extreme domain shift is illustrated in this figure. Deep network models generalize poorly to novel data drawn from a different distribution compared to the training data. We have illustrated the problem here with the shift between synthetic and real distributions. The objective is to utilize synthetically generated labeled data and unlabeled real data to reduce domain shift when evaluated on real data. We propose a GAN-based training approach to learn a common feature space where the distance between source and target distributions are minimized. Contrary to a few other approaches to domain adaptation, we address the large-scale semantic segmentation task, which increases the practical significance of our work. In the proposed approach, we achieve domain invariance by deploying an adversarial game between the feature network and a generator discriminator pair. First, we invert the latent representations using a generator network. The generator images are provided as input to a discriminator network. Now the discriminator performs two tasks, domain prediction and an auxiliary classification. The feedback from the discriminator to the feature network ensures that the domain invariant features are learned in a class consistent manner. Our whole pipeline is shown in this figure. It consists of two main components, a supervised component and an adversarial component. The last term used to update the F network consists of three paths. The supervisory loss from the classification network, the auxiliary classification loss from the discriminator, and the domain prediction loss from the discriminator. For the real data, since it's unlabeled, only the domain prediction loss is used to update the F network. During test time, the network is deployed as a simple standalone network without the GAN components. We perform quantitative experiments over two large-scale adaptation settings, Cynthia to cityscapes and GTA 5 to cityscapes. Results on Cynthia to cityscapes shows a MIOU gain of 9.1 over a stronger source-only baseline network compared to the previous approaches. The bottom row shows the target-only performance, which is the ideal oracle performance obtained when trained using labeled data in the target domain. Note that for the problem of unsupervised domain adaptation, labeled data is unavailable in the target domain. Similarly, results on GTA 5 to cityscapes also shows a significant improvement in the baseline performance and compared to the previous approaches. Next, we show a couple of ablative experiments. In the first experiment, we provide empirical results on the Cynthia cityscape setting, validating our design choices for the proposed approach. The top row shows the performance of the baseline network trained only on source data, and the bottom row shows the uh, performance of the full system trained using the proposed approach. Predict, predicting a spatial grid of the output of the discriminator instead of a single scalar as done in traditional GANs further improves performance. Use of the auxiliary classifier last term when updating the feature network results in lower class confusion and hence better performance in the target domain. The last row shows the full improvement obtained by our whole system. Next, we show visual reconstructions from the generator network obtained during training. The top row shows the original images, and the bottom row contains the generator images. Can we clearly observe that the improved generator quality results in improved performance? For more analysis and additional experiments, please visit our poster. Our code is available online on GitHub. Thank you. Hello, I'm presenting on behalf of uh, Sayed Mousavi, who was denied entry visa to come to the conference. Uh, we're interested in understanding the geometry of the classification regions induced by deep networks and see if we can exploit that to understand and improve robustness. So, first of all, what is the topology of the classification regions? Are they uh, shattered? Are they a bunch of little islands? Is that <laughs> running? Uh, or are they connected regions? So we set up an experiment to uh, test this hypothesis. You have to use your imagination in case the uh, image doesn't show. And so we set up an experiment to test this hypothesis, and it turns out that perhaps surprisingly, the regions induced by deep networks are actually connected. And so that means that for every pair of images that belongs to the same class, you can find a continuous path that stays within the class. And that path includes random images, include adversarially perturbed images, as well as natural images. So 
once we understand that the topology is connected, a natural question is what is the curvature of the decision boundary? So if you take a point that is near the decision boundary and look at the curvature of the boundary at the nearest point, you can compute the principal curvatures there. And uh, sorry, this is slightly delayed. And so the principal curvatures, uh, you can plot them as the function of the dimension and uh, the curvature. And what you find is that near, uh, oh, I see where well, this is uh, out of time because this is the old presentation. It's not the one that we uploaded this morning. Okay, I apologize. But in any case, the plot on the right, what you see is that uh, the curvature, the principal curvatures are mostly flat, which means that in most directions around the boundaries, the curvature is close to zero, but there are also uh, directions along which the curvature is highly negative uh, or highly positive. Highly negative means that they are uh, con con concave and highly uh, positive means they are convex. So uh, the next question then is, uh, well, why is this important? This is important because uh, the shape of the decision boundary in the vicinity of data points correlates to the robustness of classifier to perturbations in the images. And so uh, what you find empirically is that perturbations that uh, are along the directions where the decision boundary is flat uh, do not affect the class, whereas perturbations along the directions where the boundary is highly curved are, uh, do affect the class. And so as you can see here, the number of misclassifications is highly dependent on whether they are in the direction of highly curved uh, or, or high curvature or uh, in the flat uh, regions. And so we want to see if we can exploit this uh, insight to detect adversarially perturbed images. And again, this is the old one. And so what we find is that you might have noticed in the previous plot that there was an asymmetry. For real images, uh, the negative curvatures are slightly larger than the positive curvatures. So which means that for real images, the curvature, the average curvature at the boundary near the, near the point is uh, negative. The opposite is true on average for uh, adversarially perturbed images. And so you can use this very simple criterion, this discriminant without any training, which is the average curvature of the boundary near the data point to decide whether they are real images or adversarially perturbed images. And what you find is that this already yields a very high precision at different de for different networks, different data sets, and different degrees of uh, perturbations. Uh, meaning different multiples of the minimum perturbation that's necessary to induce a change in the class. Thank you. I am Massimiliano Mancini, and today I will present Boosting Domain Adaptation by Discovering Latent Domains, a joint work by me, Lorenzo Porzi, Samuel Rotabulò, Barbara Caputo, and Elisa Ricci. In standard of supervised domain adaptation, what we have is a labeled source domain, an unlabeled target domain, and we want to exploit the source data in order to build a model for the target domain, overcoming the underlying domain shift between the two sets. The standard setting assumes the presence of a single source domain. Another scenario is the multi-source one, where multiple source domains are available and their presence can be exploited to better tackle the domain shift problem. An assumption of this setting is that we know to which domain each image belongs. The question is if we can still exploit the advantages of multi-source domain adaptation, even if the multiple source domains are mixed and no prior about the data to which each sample belongs is available. To answer this question, we start from recent works on single source domain adaptation. It has been shown that considering domain-specific batch normalization layers is an effective way of addressing this task. In fact, Normalizing through domain-specific statistics allows, forces the samples of the different domains to be, allowed, to be aligned to the same reference distribution, thus automatically addressing the domain shift problem. This approach can be easily extended to the multi-source case by just considering one batch normalization layer per domain. Obviously, this will still require the knowledge of the domain membership of each sample, something that we do not assume. And to overcome this issue, uh, we propose our novel model, which has two new components. First, assuming the presence of k-latent domains, in order to replace the domain prior, we compute the domain assignment, which assigns to each sample a vector. This vector denotes the probability that the sample belongs to each of the k-latent domains that we assume to have. Next, we employ what we call a multi-domain alignment layer. 
This layer performs a weighted batch normalization of each sample, exploiting the given assignments to compute the statistics needed for the normalization. The combination of the domain assignment branch and the multi-domain alignment layers allows to collect statistics for multiple domains, even without the explicit presence of a priori domain separation. Here we show an example of our framework as applied to the AlexNet architecture. The domain assignment is computed by a domain prediction branch, and in the standard case when no domain label is available, the branch is trained with an entropy loss. Obviously, a log loss can be added if some of the samples owns a domain label. For what concerns the DA classification module, it is trained using a log loss for the label through samples and an entropy loss for the target ones. Here you can see some of the results. The table on the left shows the results for the ResNet architecture in the PAX dataset, introduced by Lee in the last ICCV, and containing images of photo, art paintings, cartoon, and, and sketches. In this setting, our model partially fills the gap between the single source baseline and the multi-source counterpart. The reason for this boost can be found in the qualitative analysis on the bottom, where we show the top 10 images assigned to each of the latent domains. Each row represents a different domain. The table on the right shows the comparison with previous shallow domain discovery algorithms in the well-known Office 31 dataset, with our model outperforming all of them. Thank you, and if you have any questions, please come to our poster, D12. Good morning. My name is Da Wei Yang from the University of Michigan, and I'll present our work on shape from shading through shape evolution. Deep learning requires a large amount of training data. A promising way to generate such data is to render synthetic images through computer graphics. This is especially suitable for 3D reconstruction tasks. Indeed, synthetic images have been used in many recent works on a variety of tasks ranging from viewpoint estimation, 3D object reconstruction and recognition to normal estimation in indoor scenes. But the use of synthetic images comes with a significant challenge. To render synthetic images, we need 3D content, in particular, 3D shapes. They are sufficiently diverse such that they help the train network to generalize well on real images. Prior work has all relied on datasets of manually constructed shapes, but such data are, is expensive to collect and are ultimately limited in the number of distinct shapes. In, their, in this work, we ask whether we can do away with shape datasets and instead generate shapes automatically. Our key idea is to use evolutionary algorithms to automatically generate new shapes. The network trained on these shapes is then evaluated on a small real data set to give feedback on the fitness of each shape. Then we evolve new shapes by selecting and combining existing shapes. To generate complex shapes, we start from simple primitives such as spheres, cylinders, cubes, and cones. We then compose new shapes from existing ones based on their fitness scores. To enable shape composition and transformation, we use implicit surface representation so that each shape can be represented by a single computation graph of its implicit function. In our full algorithm, we evolve shapes in, conjunct in conjunction with training a deep network. We start with an initial population of shapes and an untrained deep network. For each shape and the population, we use it to render synthetic data and train the network. The network is then evaluated on real images to generate the fitness score for this shape. We then repeat this process to get a fitness score for each shape, and then retain the network for the next round. Now we evolve a new set of shapes by selecting and combining shapes with high fitness scores. This completes one iteration of our joint evolution and training. We then iterate multiple times until convergence. We evaluate our methods on the shape from shading task using the uh, 
MIT Berkeley Intrinsic Images dataset. We compare with SERFs, a state-of-the-art shape from shading approach. We also compare with training deep networks using shapes from ShapeNet. We show that with shapes evolved without feedback, we can do that as well as SERFs and ShapeNet. With our full algorithm, we achieve significant improvement over the prior state-of-the-art using only automatically generated shapes. For more details, please visit our poster at D15 during the poster session. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ian Zhao Zhou. I'm going to present our work, Weekly Supervised Instant Segmentation Using Class Pick Response. Instant segmentation, which aims to detect and segment each object in the image, is an important and challenging task. Cutting-edge methods can now produce amazing results, yet still rely on rich annotated training data. Dense instance-level annotations are very expensive. In contrast, image-level labels, the percents of object categories, are much easier to obtain and can even be automatically crowded from the internet. This raises the question that, can we perform instance-level segmentation based on image-level supervision? To address this challenging task, we propose to explore instance-well visual cues from classification networks trained with image-level labels only. Previous works have shown that CNNs can learn representations of discriminative visual concepts without explicit supervision. We argue that these concepts mainly exist within a single instance, as it's difficult for multiple instances to form a stable pattern. Therefore, we can obtain cues for each instance from representations learned by CNNs. To do so, we first convert pre-trained networks to fully convolution networks that generate a response map for each object category. These class response maps roughly specify class-related regions, yet it's not sufficient for distinguishing different instances from the same category. However, local maximums, or picks on it, correspond to instance-related visual cues as they indicate matches between the receptive field and the learned representation. In the training period, we focus the network to learn from highly informative receptive fields estimated by class peak responses to enhance the learned representations. Here are some visualizations generated by activation maximization technique. In the inference phase, we utilize bottom-up activation and the learned convolution filters to model top-down relevance between locations of adjacent layers. Based on it, we backpropagate each class pick response to decode corresponding representation. The resulting pick response map served as a fine detailed instance of well visual cues which highlight informative regions of each instance visualized with different colors. At last, with the class of well and instance of well visual cues extracted from classification at work, we retrieve instance mask from segment proposals off the shelf. Here are some results on Pascal VOC dataset showing that promising visual cues and predictions can be obtained even in some complex scenarios. As a first step in this challenging task, the overall performance is still bounded by the proposal quantity. Nevertheless, the proposed technique shows great potential in video and RGBD applications where rich information can be utilized to produce proposals of high quality. Welcome to our poster and thanks for your attention. Hello, everyone. 
I'm Wei Chen Zhang from the University of Sydney. Today, I would like to share our work, Collaborative and Adversarial Network for Unsupervised Meditation. This work is collaborated with Dong Xu and Wanli Ouyang from the University of Sydney and Wen Li from ETH Zurich. In unsupervised meditation, we have a labeled source data set and an unlabeled target data set with same classes, given that the source and target distribution are different. The goal of the task is to categorize the unlabeled target data set into the given classes. Many works have been sung to solve this problem. For deep learning approaches, if we directly fine tune the CNN with only the labeled source images, due to the domain data distribution mismatch, the unlabeled target samples may not classify well. So in a adversarial, domain adversarial neural network, they try to learn the domain invariant features which are not distinguishable by the different domains. To achieve this, they use a domain classifier and a gradient reversal layer with using the unlabeled target samples. In this way, the feature of different domains become much closer for easier categorization. Therefore, DNN tries to learn the domain invariant features at the final layer. So when doing the backpropagation, all the features are learned in domain invariant way. However, we think that the representation at lower layers are often low-level features, for example, the corners and edges. They are useful for distinguishing not only images from domain, different domains, but also images from different classes. Therefore, instead of learning domain invariant features, we should make these low-level features distinguishable from different domains. In addition, pseudo-labeling method has been proven useful for semi-supervised learning. We also propose a new method that uses reliable pseudo-labeled target samples that are labeled by the image classifier in order to better adapt to the target domain. For the structure of our CAM model, in formal layers, we use domain collaborative and learning, which use domain classifier D to let the network learn more domain distinguishable features. And in the later layers, we use domain adversarial learning to learn domain invariant features using the domain classifier and gradient reversal layer. We add domain loss function to automatically learn the weighting parameter Ws to let earlier features become more distinguishable by the domain classifier. And finally, a class label predictor C is used to predict the object category. And in addition, for our incremental CAN, in each training epoch, we select some reliable pseudo-label target samples in retraining the model. Apart from other methods which only use image classifier confidence to guide our sample selection, we introduce a last domain classifier guidance selection and weighting method. So in details, after one training epoch, we get the prediction confidence from image classifier C and the score from domain classifier DM for each sample. Only the target samples that are larger than the confidence threshold and in between the domain inverse range are selected to retrain the model. And in addition, we utilize the weighting function to weigh the contribution of the loss for each selected sample. The weights are greater than if the score from the domain classifier are closer to 0 0.5. And in our experiments, we use ResNet50 as a backbone network. And we test our model with two data set Office 31 and image CREFDA. Results indicate that our method I can achieve the best. In conclusion, our method can additionally learn domain distinguishable representation in early layers to learn the better low level features, and I can iteratively perform the pseudo label target sample selection every way by using the domain classifier to learn the better feature from target domain. Please come to our poster D21 for more details. Thanks. Hi everyone, I'm Shu Xinxie from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Today I will present our work on environment upgrade reinforcement learning for non-differentiable multi-stage pipelines. So uh, multi-stage pipelines have been popular in many different tasks. For example, multi-person post estimation or uh, instance segmentation. But there are problems existing in these frameworks. First, at inference time, information cannot feed back from downstream to upstream. For example, this is a common error case of post estimation caused by wrong bounding box prediction. And since information cannot feed back, there is no way to correct this error at inference time.
And the second problem is that at chaining time, different stages are usually chained separately and connected together by a non-differentiable function. So the system, overall system cannot be trained in an end-to-end -end manner and, and they are not jointly optimized. So uh, to address this problem, we present environment upgrade reinforcement learning. First, unlike standard multi-stage pipelines, we relinks the downstream to upstream by a reinforcement learning agent. And second, we jointly optimize the reinforcement learning agent and the downstream stage, which is also called the environment. A more detailed description is given in the next slide. So uh, first, uh, stage one takes the image as input and generates a set of parameter omega, which is processed by a non-differentiable function to prepare input for the second stage network, the recognition network. And its output is STR, the recognition prediction. Then these two forms the state of the system ST, and the overall part is the environment. Then um, the agent used the system state and input and sample and action AT from its policy pi. The action AT will change, will change the output omega, of omega, and then which in turn change the input to the second stage network and then the recognition output. This forms a loop and the system keep iterating until we reach the maximum number of iteration or the agent samples and terminate action. And the uh, final output is the last elements, is the last SDR in the sequence. We conduct several experiments and the first experiment is on post estimation. This is the refinement process of the bounding box to obtain better post estimation. And here's another example. And as we can see, the pose is getting better as the bounding box is more correct. And this is on the instant segmentation experiment, which given initial non-perfect bounding box, our system can refine the bounding box to obtain better segmentation results. And this is another example. So thank you, and welcome to our poster part at E2. Yeah. So good morning, everyone. My name is Ashim Ake. I'm going to present our work on teaching categories to human learners with visual explanations. This is joint work conducted with my colleagues at Caltech. So humans have powerful visual recognition abilities that enables us to perform complex image understanding tasks. However, attaining expertise in challenging visual domains can be a long process requiring large amounts of training. In this work, we address the problem of teaching visual categories to human learners. Specifically, we propose a novel teaching algorithm that takes a set of labeled images as input and by modeling noisy learners generates a sequence of teaching images. There's a large body of work of exploring the design and analysis of algorithms for automatic teaching, starting with theoretical models with limited noise assumptions to models that take into account the memory decay during learning. Approaches exist for teaching visual categories, but they typically provide very limited feedback to the students during teaching. Specifically, existing approaches perform the following two steps. First, they show an image to the student and ask them to guess which category it contains. Then they provide feedback in the form of the correct class name. Crucially, it's up to the student to determine which visual features or attributes are discriminative for that class. This can be very challenging to discover for fine-grained visual categories. Feedback is much more informative when it comes with some form of explanation. Our teaching algorithm provides visual explanations as feedbacks and models how easy it is for these explanations for the student to interpret. So here I'll present some intuition as to how our model works. As input, it takes a low-dimensional embedding of a set of images, displayed here as a set of 2D circles, where the color indicates the class label. We also require corresponding visual explanations, highlighting informative reasons for each specific instance. 
Note that not all explanations are equally informative, and our teaching model takes this into account when selecting examples. So finally, we also assume we have access to a set of hypotheses that represent different schools of thought that may be held by the students. Here we display these hypotheses as linear classifiers, where H star represents the hypothesis we wish to teach. For details on how we can automatically generate all this information, please consult our paper. Our probabilistic model selects teaching examples along with their corresponding explanations so that hypotheses that are inconsistent with the ground truth are eliminated as quickly as possible. When each teaching example is displayed to the student, shown here in orange, we model them as switching to another hypothesis if it's inconsistent with the information they've just received. Here the thickness of the lines represent the posterior probability associated with each hypothesis, also shown in the top right corner. This process then repeats until a set of teaching examples have been selected that eliminates all inconsistent hypotheses. So we performed experiments on real human learners across three different data sets using Mechanical Turk. Our data sets include images of butterflies captured by citizen scientists, where we see the representative images on top with their corresponding explanations below. Images of human retinas collected and labeled by ophthalmologists, and handwritten Chinese characters. For our experiments, participants first performed a brief tutorial to familiarize themselves with the teaching interface. Then they were shown a sequence of teaching images, and then for each image, they were asked which category it belonged to. Feedback was given in the form of the correct class label, along with a visual explanation. After teaching, they were evaluated on a held out test set. We compare the performance of our model against several teaching baseline algorithms. On the left, we show the test time performance of students who were thought with random images with no explanations. Here, students are binned based on their test performance, and in this example, we can see while most perform better than chance, they don't do very well overall. In comparison, our model significantly improves the generalization performance of students. So for more details and results, please stop by our poster. Thanks. All right, now we're going to have the last oral talk of the session. This is Taskonomy, Disentangling Task Transfer Learning. The work is by Amir Zamir, Alexander Sachs, William Shen, Leonidas Guibas, Jatendra Malik, and Silvio Cervese. And the talk will be given by Amir. This talk is the best paper award winner. So we're really excited and please welcome Amir. Sorry about the technical difficulties. I'm Amir Zamir presenting Taskonomy, Disentangling Task Transfer Learning. And this joint work with Alexander Sachs, William Shen, Leo Gibos, Jitana Malik, and Sylvia Silvers. So let me start by asking a question. Um, are the problems we solve in computer vision related to each other or independent? Um, for instance, take depth estimation and surface normal estimation, or object detection and room layout. We know the answer to the question I asked is yes, either through intuition or analytical knowledge. Like we know, surface normals or derivative of depth or room layout provides a strong spatial priors for object detection. So some relationship between tasks clearly exists, but why does this matter? And how could such relationships be crucially useful? And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Also, task relationships exist. 
They can be confidentially measured without needing to encode any human knowledge in them. We see tasks as belonging to a structured space rather than isolated concepts. And this can provide us with a unified model for transfer learning. All right, so the example I showed was just for a couple of tasks. But there exist many more. And the same question can be asked about any sets of tasks, if or how they would be related. If we can answer these questions, it gives us a rather global window to relationships and redundancies between tasks. That enables us, enables us to see tasks rather uh, in concert rather than in isolation and utilize the redundancies and relationships between them to be more efficient by recycling what can be recycled. It's particularly desirable to be more efficient in terms of supervision as we would like to solve problems with using less labeled data. And that's our focus here. Reducing the need to label data has been the intention of a large body of research literature. Um, Self-supervised learning or unsupervised learning, meta-learning, domain adaptation, or using ImageNet features off the shelf, which is the common practice today, or the fine-tuning mechanism that we all employ. So in fact, the relationship between tasks is what enables transfer learning. So in high level, transfer learning states a model developed for one particular task may be useful for solving another if the two tasks are related in some form. Let me make that more tangible with an example. So take the problem of surface normal estimation. For this example image, this is the ground truth surface normals. And these are the surface normals results estimated by a neural network specifically trained for the task of normal estimation with a lot of data. So the results look good, obviously. And this is the results estimated by a neural network trained with 50 times less data which gives poor results as expected. Now, here I show the results of transferring from two networks trained for two other tasks of image reshading and segmentation. The transfer is done using a small readout network trained with that 50 times less data that I mentioned earlier. So you can see that, for instance, segmentation doesn't, the reshading does provide good surface normal results, right? And while segmentation doesn't do that, this suggests the relationship between reshading and surface normals is stronger than the one between segmentation and surface normals. This makes intuitive sense, since we know shading of a scene has a lot to do with the normals of the surfaces in it, while the relationship between segmentation and normals is not clear to be, is not clear to be existing. So, so we observed when problems appear related, they could supply useful information for solving each other. And if we have some machinery for quantifying such relationships at a scale between any sets of tasks, we can form that complete graph that gives us the global window that we wanted to have to understand the redundancies between tasks. For instance, this can be used to solve a set of tasks in concert while minimizing the required supervision by leveraging the redundancies that I mentioned earlier, as shown here where all tasks are being transferred to from only three sources or solve a desired novel task, which we don't have enough labeled data for. That's because solving a new task becomes a matter of inserting it in this structure rather than starting from scratch. So this is what taxonomy is about. It's a fully confidential method for quantifying task relationships at a scale and extracting a unified structure out of them as a model for transfer learning. As a model for transfer learning. We call it task taxonomy or tasconomy as it devises a taxonomical transfer policy over tasks. Okay, so here's more details about how we do this. First, we define a set of tasks, including a broad set of 26 semantic 3D and 2D problems. This dictionary is not meant to be an exhaustive list of all vision tasks that we care about, but it's a sample set that we use actually for modeling. We'll discuss generalization to out of this dictionary later in the talk. We collected a data set of about four million images of indoor scenes where each image has ground truth annotations for each of the 26 tasks. These images are real, they are not synthetic, and they are registered against meshes, against 3D meshes that are actually constructed using a structured light sensors. So that makes the process of extracting the ground truth, ground truth, uh, ground truth of our 3D tasks easier for us. All right, then we train a network for each of the 26 tasks that we have in our dictionary. We call them task-specific networks. So here you can see the results of these networks applied frame by frame on a YouTube video. Um, here, this bounding box shows the subset of 3D tasks. For instance, 3D curvature 
or here are the semantic tasks like object detection and some self-supervised tasks like colorization and some low-level tasks like edges and key points. All right, so our modeling has four main steps. As I mentioned earlier, in the first step, we train a task-specific network for each of, the, each of the tasks that we have in our dictionary. And we freeze their weights. Oops, we freeze their weights. And we repeat the process for all of the tasks that we have in our dictionary. So each task, at this point, will have one task-specific network. Now, the next step is quantifying the relationship between tasks. Like, for instance, take the relationship between normals and curvature. We take the encoder of the task a specific network of normals with the frozen weights, and we train a small readout network to read curvature from the representation of the normal encoder. This small network is then evaluated on an unseen test set, and its performance determines the edge weight, specifying the strength of their directed transfer relationship. All right. Well, as there are 26 tasks in our dictionary, there are 26 by 25 feasible transfer functions, and we train all of them. So at this point, this gives us the complete directed graph of relationships that we wanted. However, these, value, these values require normalization, as these tasks live in different output spaces and with different numerical properties. This is best visible over the adjacency matrix of the complete graph that I'm showing up there, where you can see that certain rows are clearly dominating the matrix. That's because of the fact that I mentioned that these tasks are living in different output spaces. So we need to normalize this. So we normalize this matrix using an ordinal scheme called analytic hierarchical process. Hierarchical process. I'm not going to get into too much details about that, but briefly we adopted an ordinal scheme since it makes less assumptions about the numerical properties of the output spaces compared to linear normalization or similar parametric approaches, and we found that to be crucial. We have more details of this in the paper and the poster. All right, so at this point, we have our no, uh, affinity matrix, uh, the complete graph of relationships completely normalized. So this complete graph of relationships is essentially exhaustively quantified, pairwise set of tasks evaluated in terms of transfer dependency. Notice that all of these transfers are not useful. Many of them are weak, but there are quite a strong ones there too, and clearly exist some patterns. So we would like to extract a sparse structure out of them, out of this complete graph. This sparse structure should maximize the performance of solving all tasks and tell us what tasks are better to be picked as source to best support solving all other tasks, or how to transfer to a novel task that we haven't, we hadn't uh, in our in our original task dictionary, right? So again, without getting into details in the talk, in the interest of time, about this particular step, this problem can be formulated as a subgraph selection. Well, we define a dictionary here, which includes both previously seen tasks shown by gray notes here, as well as novel tasks shown by red notes here. Then we code a set of constraints and optimize them using binary integer programming to extract the optimal subgraph. Now, the details of this step are again in the paper and poster, which is straightforward. Um, so at this point, to summarize, the output of this subgraph selection process gives us, devises a connectivity that solves all targets, including the novel ones, maximizes, the, maximizes their collective performance while using only the available sources, and no more than a user-specified budget, which determines the maximum allowed number of used source tasks. And that's what we wanted, and that's our taxonomy. So one point that I skipped in the interest of time was also higher order transfers. Higher order transfers are the cases where two or more source tasks get together to transfer to a budget, and we include them in our, in our framework. So our, uh, so our affinity matrix is actually much bigger than 26 by 25 because it includes the higher, higher order case as well. All right, so some experimental results. Like I said, we have 26 total number of tasks. Therefore, 26 task-specific networks, about 3,000 transfer functions, which took about 47,000 GPU hours to train. Good for cloud computing companies. Um, the, transfer, the transfer functions were, were trained with 8 to 100 times less training data than task-specific networks. All right. So here's a, here's a sample taxonomy. This particular taxonomy was computed to solve the, the 26 tasks that I put down there with four of them are target-only tasks, meaning that they have only very limited data 
supervised data that was just enough to train the readout functions, but obviously not the full task and specific networks. So look at the connectivity. Intuitively, it makes sense. 3D tasks are usually connected to other 3D tasks or similarly semantic tasks. They're getting their information from other semantic tasks and optionally maybe higher order information from other neighboring tasks. So to quantify the results that the tra this transfer policy would achieve, we use two metrics, gain and quality. The color coding here shows the value of gain. Gain is a win rate that quantifies how much value was gained by employing transferring. So note that gain values are usually deep blue, denoting 100% meaning that there was a lot of benefit in using transfer learning and not. Here I'm showing the quality values. The quality metric is a win rate that quantifies how close to gold the standard task-specific task networks the transfer results got. So again, note that the quality values often approach white, which denote 50%, meaning that certain transfer results started getting close to their gold standard task-specific task networks. All right, so this was just a sample taxonomy. Um, Taxonomy can be computed with arbitrary arguments, and the best way to, to understand it is through our live web API, which you can specify any argument you want, run taxonomy, and see the qualitative and quantitative results. Specifically, the results compared to using ImageNet features, which is the popular practice again today, that you can see there that the ImageNet features are outperformed significantly by using taxonomical features, which has actually important implications that we have discussed in the paper. We also have a set of experiments uh, in the paper. Um, they're important, but we didn't include them in the talk. Um, for instance, significance test showing how important it is to use this particular taxonomy found by our method rather than just any connectivity. Um, evaluating the trends found on taxonomy data set on, on ImageNet and MIT places to make sure the results are not data set specific. Um, we evaluate the sensitivity to choice of dictionary. Um, oops. I got my we evaluate the model dependence by testing on varying architectures, and also generalization to single out-of-network tasks, and compare that to self-supervised and unsupervised ImageNet-based baselines that again show they are outperformed by a large margin and the implications of that are discussed in the paper again. So the summary, we took a striving first step towards understanding the space of vision tasks. And we, treat, we started treating tasks in concert coming from a rather a structured space as opposed to isolated concepts. As illustrated in this force at last plot that was, that was created using our quantified relationships. We proposed a fully computational framework for this purpose, providing a unified model for transfer learning. And we are moving hopefully towards a generalist model for perception. And oops, generalist model for perception. And I can take questions while I play YouTube video of actually the convention center that we applied the task bank on. You can see the results here. We also thank the award committee for the recognition. So again, if you have questions, please come up to the microphones. Yes, uh, this is excellent work. Um, Say I have a new task that's not one of your 26 tasks, mm -hmm. and I want to apply what you've learned. How do I know which, uh, which of your 26 pre-trained uh, networks you know, to use towards my new task? Right. Yeah, so that's specifically included in the formulation. So if you remember the plot that I showed, there was like some red task and some gray. The, reds, the red tasks are those, the ones that you haven't seen before, but now you want to solve them. And that's the process of essentially insertion. So, so for those, you need a very limited amount of data, let's say 2,000 images, to be able to, tra to train those readout functions. So that essentially tells you where in that like, circular graph your new task belongs. Right? Obviously, you can't use your new task as a source because you can't train a fully fleshed network for it. But that process is just enough for it to tell you which sources are best supporting that particular task. And, and for instance, the taxonomy that I showed, four of the tasks were like fitting the scenario that you explained. There was no supervised, supervised data for it except for like 2,000 images. Thank you. No uh, how does your task graph um, help us in understanding joint training tasks? So if you wanted to train, say, a dense task like segmentation mm -hmm. and a discriminative task like classification to have one joint network, uh, what does this task graph tell us about 
training process that are like that. They right. seem kind of complementary. Right. So um, essentially, you're you're pointing out like multitask learning. Right. You want to actually have one network completely blended together to provide two outputs. In a way, it's actually the opposite of what we do. Right. We keep them separate and just merge them in the end. Um, so. It, it, the, the question that you're asking doesn't have a clear answer based on like what we have studied here. But I can tell you that basically, again, the relationships obviously here will tell you the similarities and let's say in a sense of mutual information between tasks. So I would definitely expect that to be a guideline for which tasks to be merged into one network. Right. Let's say how much you would need to expand your learning capacity when you add one more, one more task. Obviously, if two tasks are similar, I would expect not much learning capacity needs to be added to our network and so on. So I think, so I think basically the, the answer to your questions, the guideline would be in those like quantified relationships. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. I think we're out of time. So let's thank Amir again. And this